see him in India soon. So here you go. I hope so too. Thank you so much for the introduction. And Jyoti, you've helped to pull a lot of this together. Do you want to give a little overview of, of how this session is going to work? Yes. So uh, basically, uh, you know, Ivan founded a consulting firm Notosh, which is, you know, a decade ago from his kitchen table in Edinburgh, growing it into offices in Melbourne, Adelaide, New York, and Toronto. So he uh, wishes, you know, we connected with him, you know, uh, uh, through our ideas, which we had, uh, which we are very grateful to our learning community and members that they took time out to reflect and share the virtual learning ideas with which we uh, took forward the step to reach out to Ivan and, you know, have this webinar put together. Now, this having a very innovative, uh, you know, uh, the topic, the area that we wish to cover in which he gave a brilliant idea was about how to design, you know, uh, 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 going ahead with uh, in these unprecedented times to design a transition, which uh, is, um, he's going to present and talk about it, how to go about it and how to, you know, he's going to uh, uh, take you through the, the journey of designing the transition in these unprecedented times. And then after his presentation, we are going to have a question answer session, wherein you can put in your questions into the chat box. You're also free to unmute yourself and put in your questions there as in in person. And then Ivan would take it further from there. Also, during the presentation and talk, we would like you to have your, uh, you know, your videos can be on, of course, we would uh, like to see you all. But uh, the microphones can be on mute so that, you know, there's no external uh, disturbance that happens from the background noise. So yes, we welcome you all and we are really, really grateful to our IC community who has always given us overwhelming responses to all our webinars which we have been doing under IC Virtual Learning uh, Program 2020. We thought of this much before the COVID had hit um, India and uh, we have been very successful all because of the community, all because of the heads, all because of the management and our academic professional community, which is the most important who have uh, you know, given us overwhelming responses wherein we have to, uh, you know, segregate our webinars into, you know, certain, uh, 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 you know, repeat sessions as well as in part one of two, part two of two. And we have already, uh, you know, uh, a lot of webinars shelved for July, which we have been, we, which we are forced to keep it, you know, in pipeline because of the, uh, you know, the, the active uh, participation we've got from the community. So we are really, really grateful on behalf of the chairman and founding, uh, you know, person of Thaisi Ms. Munga. I would like to thank all of you for being here. And also uh, I would like to thank everyone for being, you know, available, uh, you know, 15 minutes before the sessions. Uh, a lot of our audience, of course, follows what Thaisi says. So we are, we are really, really grateful to you. Now I would hand over to Ivan and, uh, uh, I would also enjoy to be part of this, even though I'm a non-academic person. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very all. much. Thanks for a lovely welcome. And um, yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's for, for us an opportunity to uh, share some of our thinking. Um, my team, I'll, I'll share a little bit of um, where you can catch up afterwards with things. I always like to start with where you can uh, go and get some more if you want to uh, refresh your memory and uh, uh, understand things perhaps if the accent is a little strong or the uh, talk a little too fast. Um, during the talk I'd ask you just to make sure that your microphone is on mute and um, it stops any feedback coming through uh, and make sure that we have a nice uh, clean uh, recording if you like for everyone else. So um, the first thing is you can find out about Notosh. Notosh was uh, this, this firm that I created um, on the uh, back of, uh, a, a, you know, a, a, if you like, quite a quite a tumultuous time in itself. Actually, um, it was a the the word no tosh in, in Scottish English mean um, that you don't want to have any nonsense, no nonsense. And so, why did I create that? It was the height of the financial crisis. I'd been working for a television company um, outside education, so um, 
had seen how amazing creative people worked in times of great stress and at the time I was wondering how schools might uh, cope in the same way and so around the kitchen table it was actually my wife who suggested the name No Tosh, No Nonsense, it kind of sums up the attitude and approach of our team and at this time fast forward 10 years, 11 years and uh, we find ourselves in a very similar situation uh, one of uh, stress, maybe initially at least some uh, sense of panic almost. And so um, overcoming that really needs um, not stress and panic, but it needs a no nonsense approach uh, to things to make sure that um, people are clear on what we're trying to achieve. Uh, they know what they've got to do and they know their role in making this transition happening uh, happen. And so the transition, the idea behind transition design is you move from a crisis into something more sustainable, a sustainable future. I'll give you one very simple case in point. Um, in the last uh, 106 days, uh, I've been stuck at this desk, I've been stuck at home, unable to walk more than five miles um, from my home. And that's about to change and I'm very grateful for that. But it's been tough for someone who's um, really benefited from polluting the planet with one aeroplane at a time, but enjoyed seeing that planet and enjoyed the travel and meeting people face to face. Um, the silver lining of this, of course, is an environmental one. I'm so happy that we're able to share insights and ideas with each other without needing to uh, have a cost for the environment. So that's an example of uh, designing for the transition, trying to work out how to communicate ideas in a colorful way, how to collaborate really effectively online, and uh, bring people uh, together. That is where you choose the action that you're going to have. Now, for the last three, four, five months or so, we've been working with schools across Asia, then into Aus Australia and in Europe, uh, and then into North and Latin America in this wave of uh, in initially panic and then trying to work out what to do next. And it's not been easy for a lot of people, but it's not been easy, I think, because in the Northern Hemisphere, we've used summer holidays as a kind of what we call a forward anchor. So we think, well, you know, we've got this um, holiday coming up. So as long as we just sprint and keep working up until that holiday, we can collapse then, uh, have a break, and then work out what we do and regroup. Um, that's treating what's going on at the moment like a, a campaign. And one of the most exciting jobs that I had uh, in Notosh was um, uh, nearly nine years ago leading a campaign. Uh, I was co-directing the digital part of a campaign, a political campaign in Scotland, which was uh, until last year, the most successful election campaign anywhere in the world for the difference that it made in the result, the result that could have been. And using digital media to connect and planning a campaign means that for 100 days or so, you don't sleep much, you don't see your family much, and you have um, a lot of hard work. This was me at the beginning of the campaign, looking a little healthier than uh, perhaps I do today. Um, and uh, what was interesting about that is... Um, sorry, just make sure your microphone's on. Just to make sure your microphones are on mute and uh, uh, otherwise we'll have that feedback coming through from uh, from uh, from your uh, microphone. Thank you very much. So um, uh, as I was saying, the, camp, the, the idea of running a campaign is one that is um, it re relies on energy. It relies on uh, being able to make sense of a large amount of data uh, quickly. Uh, making decisions every day um, and so for example we had um, laid out all the strategies that we would use at the beginning of the campaign from traditional media through to television through to printed media and then in the orange post-it notes closer to us all the things that regular folk could do to to make this campaign work we laid those out on our campaign wall and then every day worked our way through that campaign um, picking the tactic, the strategy that we wanted to use each morning at the morning briefing. And this morning briefing happened every day and very often in the evening there would be a closing briefing too. The campaign director sits in the middle, starts the meeting and we go uh, clockwise around that table trying to understand what the key messages are, what the key uh, uh, challenges might be in the day ahead and working out what our tactics and strategies would be. 
and you go and do it that day. You come back at the end of the day and you see how it's working. It's a what I would call a very vertical way of working, uh, very top down. It means that uh, at the end of the day, the campaign director makes the final call if we're in disagreement about something. And um, you work up until May 5th, until election day to make something happen. And that's what a campaign is. But here's the thing, what we're in at the moment is not a campaign. And it's not a campaign for three reasons. The first thing is there was no plan. Um, it's not like we had a deadline of an election day. Um, and then the, the, the final most important thing, not everyone signed up for it in the same way that volunteers sign up for a campaign. And so if your way of working has been one of a kind of almost panic, um, almost uh, working your way out as you go, um, and you know that you can do that short term, but long term it's not an option. And even for this duration, even for in my case, what 108 days, it's exhausting. It's not possible to make that work. And so what I want to do today is share some ideas that will help you break out of that campaign. And so our transition design is actually a program that we're working on with schools and leaders um, all around the world um, in six parts. And the six parts can be broken down into three big chunks uh, about listening, about designing, and then about how you communicate. And I'm going to give you um, some of the, the headlines and hopefully some of the um, some useful things to take away and use with your team straight away today. And um, the very first thing is uh, all about listening, which is important when there is no plan. Um, one of the greatest challenges when the, there is no plan is that uh, leadership teams can end up almost snapping to uh, vertical. So if you can imagine uh, that... Um, you know when you're when you're in a super stressful environment what you can end up doing as a leader where you've been quite flat before is that you um snap to vertical and you end up with a very hierarchical way of working and uh, long term that certainly doesn't work short term um it, it it's passable it can it can get the job done people know what they've got to do they know how to go about their work and uh, they know what success looks like. And because it's a campaign, you can check in regularly with each other. But long-term, that's that long-term vertical, hierarchical way of working doesn't work. And listening becomes the most important strategy. And the final thing is uh, about listening is that um, if you are uh, listening to the crisis and looking at news cycles and trying to work out what that means for you, then you're basically letting the crisis write the brief that you're going to respond to. Creative people tend to work well when they have a, a brief. Uh, a brief is like a description of the work ahead or a, a project description. If you are not writing that brief, then you're not in control of the question you're trying to answer. And that's um, not particularly useful for um, school communities. So what, what do you do? You can listen and you can together define what the problem is going to be that you solve rather than letting the problem uh, define it for you. Let me explain what I mean. The first thing you might consider doing is creating what we call uh, a project nest. Um, now, we do this in schools face to face um, when it was easy enough to do. This is a good example of a project nest. It's a room in a school um, where everyone brings back the little pieces of information that they've found when they've gone and asked the community what they think might be a good way of going about uh, business, going about learning, going around teaching or going around the business of school. Obviously, you can't have a physical project nest uh, particularly easy in anywhere in the world at the moment, but you can do it digitally. So a few weeks ago, um, we undertook this as a session that we undertook with um, about 300 educators from all across Brazil as part of a school group. And uh, on the left hand side was the first part of the day where we asked them what practices and new habits have you noticed emerging over the last two months or so. And then the second thing we asked them to do was drag uh, the uh, post-its that they had left in this exercise over to a prioritization board where we asked what from what you've seen over the last two two months has had the highest impact or met needs the best and uh, what ha what costs the most and is there anything that had high impact but cost very little 
And what we discovered, of course, is that things that cost a lot uh, but have some high impact were generally in the technology area. And we're seeing that in Scotland at the moment. A lot of people in, in Scotland um, are, are, are disenfranchised uh, from uh, blended learning or learning online because they don't have a computer at home that they can use or they don't have a solid enough internet connection at home uh, that, that is reliable enough for so many people using it at once. So expensive, takes time to resolve. Um, but on the right hand side, we're all ideas around learning, teaching and ideas that cost nothing or cost very little. So changes in pedagogy they had noticed because students were, students had to take more control of their learning. They had to be more self-sustaining. And I've noticed that with my own children. They have had no challenge at all taking ownership of what they're gonna do, when they're gonna do it and how they're going to do it. And so there's a silver lining from this last three months that I hope my daughter's own school plan into the work that they take forward next year. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's water in the sand. It's a lost opportunity. Now we would do this kind of listening activity, this kind of workshop is one way, but we would normally do this kind of listening activity by using a design team. And a design team, as you can see from this example in, in Paris, is a really mixed group. It's a group of teachers, leaders, staff, local staff, uh, students of different ages and stages, uh, parents as well. And then you get, you, the most important thing for a design team to learn is how to ask the right question, how to ask open-ended questions. And so where schools have perhaps cancelled a lot of events over the last little while, get them back in the calendar, um, consider even running some online events during the summer because not everyone's going to be able to, to get away on holiday. And think about the events you can hijack if, if you like to talk about the silver linings, the upside of this challenging time and how you're going to integrate that when school returns to some normality, but when it returns to whatever the new school is going to feel like. So professional learning events could undertake a similar activity to the one I, I just showed you there. What's worked well? Where's your pedagogy been pushed? Where's your practice been pushed? Consider local staff as well. Very often we, we do these kinds of exercises in English if we're an English medium school, but we don't undertake the same activity in the local language of staff who feel disenfranchised. They're not part of it. Well, for those of you who are leading schools in India, I think that now is the best opportunity maybe that you've got to bring your local staff closer into your community than ever before by running events to listen to them in their language, on their terms. Have breakfast. Uh, parent breakfasts are, are fantastic things to do on a regular basis. And at the moment they're free because you don't have to supply any breakfast. So have regular meetings online with small groups of parents and rich dialogue, rich discussion consider Outlook events. This was an idea of the principal at the school, uh, Jane Thompson, who you can see on the left-hand side. She got together a whole bunch of uh, board members and business people from the school community and held a, um, a kind of Outlook event, looking at what the future of business was likely to be and how school might play into that. And another one of our leaders uh, ran events for parents to experience what learning can be like when it's done this way. And I think that over the past three months, lots of parents have experienced the same kind of learning that their kids have by working remotely from home. And then finally, lots of coffee and lots of conversation in the nest. So if you have a budget for tea uh, and coffee, use it. Uh, make sure that uh, you bring people together to talk uh, so that you can listen to them. Now, um, all of this is about socialising. All of this is about bringing ideas uh, from people, listening to them. And it doesn't mean that everyone's going to have uh, positive ideas all the time. And I think that's what sometimes hold, holds leaders back, in fact, from having a go. They're worried about what people will say in front of other people. But remember, these conversations are happening anyway on WhatsApp groups, they're happening on uh, text messages. So it's super important to listen to your community, especially to your young folk, your young people in your institution and find out what creative ideas they have. They've got plenty of them, um, ask them what's worked well, but you can also look at what's not worked well. I'll share one example of that before I move on. Um, I had a, a, a wonderful colleague, um, in uh, Accra in, in Ghana who had um, asked me to facilitate a couple of meetings with her team. 
And so we brought together her middle leadership team and ran an online workshop where we looked at the metrics of success and the standards of quality expected of middle leaders or peer leaders. And what emerged in the space of a 50 minute workshop was quite magical. It was a really clear idea from these peer leaders of what uh, middle leadership should look like in the future based on the experiences they've just had. And so you can take even um, the, the pain that they'd had of maybe feeling that they, their role had changed beyond recognition to help them redesign the role of a middle leader in school and make some quite significant changes to the structure of school. And so um, that takes me nicely to the second point, which is about there being no deadline. There's, it's not like an election where you have an end date to this crisis that you can work towards and then you can sleep uh, and recover your energy. This is going on potentially for some time. And the disruption means that instead of um, kind of jumping from one decision to the other, falling into decisions, there's a need to design. And so this is the second of my three points today. Um, when you design, uh, it's, it, it's about making sure that everything you do is done with intention, uh, it, with a reason behind it, that you test assumptions, and that you are also conscious of your starting point, your reality today. Now, early on, um, when the first countries in Europe started to um, open up and uh, release their lockdown a little bit, um, the, there was very little design. There was more haste. There was a desire to get kids back to school quickly in time for a couple of weeks of learning before the end of the summer term. But what we saw and what the, the, the photos I'm about to share, share with you were taken by a French teacher who himself was not happy with what they had to do. But what you can see here is a total lack of design. The problem has not been defined. And because they've not defined the problem that they were trying to solve, they've actually gone and created a new problem. Seeing this, I'm sure most of you would actually prefer your children to stay at home and learn at home, enjoying play, enjoying uh, uh, being ar around you, around other people, and without the stress that comes from this kind of almost prison-like way of running school. And the trauma that kids will have if they go back to schools like this is significant and it shouldn't be underestimated. Trying to help children feel that they are um, going to a place where learning is going to happen, where they're going to be able to see their friends and they're going to be able to enjoy the experience is really important. Enjoying the experience is maybe the problem that we are trying to solve. How might we help students enjoy the experience of going back to the school building after a prolonged period of learning at home? Um, I don't know about you, but I feel quite nervous about the first time that I'm going to get on a plane or go on a ferry or uh, go into a, an area with lots and lots of people. Because over a over hundred days, we've formed new habits. And of course, when you form new habits, um, it takes a long time to break them. I think it's 60 days to form a habit and six days to break it. Um, but, uh, you know, if it's not six days to break it, we need to think about how to design it so it goes faster. And so to do this, really key to designing is uh, engaging with your middle leadership. Uh, middle leadership are, are so important. Um, middle leadership for me is your heads of department. It's your peer leaders as well. It's the ones who don't have leadership in their job title. Uh, but probably should. It's the ones who have um, stood up uh, in the moment of crisis and they've uh, made things happen. I'm not a fan of Margaret Thatcher, um, but I do like this phrase, this quote from her. She said, being a leader is like being a lady. If you have to remind people you are, you aren't. And I think there's a lot of leadership that's shown uh, without people having to say, I'm a leader. Um, they've, they've gone and done amazing things. So what can you do? Um, the first thing that I think if you want to be that leader or if you want to encourage those leaders is engage them in those listening exercises that you're going to do with your community and you're going to continue doing with your community. I've noticed a trend in communication from governments and from schools where because we're hitting summer, they are slowing down their communication or stopping it altogether. I don't think that's the right thing to do. I think you should keep communication going over the summer months because the nervousness is not going to disappear anytime soon. And you've got different types of listening you can do. You can have downloading 
uh, downloading means that you are listening to the person and letting them just spill. I'm downloading at the moment to you and you're having to kind of sit there and listen to it. So how could you let people uh, download? Um, the other thing that you can do is uh, uh, have conversation and conversation is where you listen in order to respond. So you're actually listening for clues for particular things you thought were going on so you can then dive deeper into it. You can have empathetic listening where you, you're digging deeper. So why, why do you think that? What makes you think that? And you can have emergent collaboration where you bring together a group of your community to design something together. Um, you think about new ideas. So that's one thing middle leadership can do. You can uh, craft uh, a new vision together. And that is really about designing the brief. You're saying, look, we're not, yes, this crisis is going on, but let's not let that define who we are. Let's sit down and design a vision together. So bring your board and leadership team together, bring your parent groups together and find out what they would like to see in school. And that's how you create a vision. What do you see in your school in a year's time? What would you like to see as you walk in through the front door? What would you like to see online on a Friday morning? And of course, you can ask people to innovate and come up with fresh ideas. Uh, that's another option. So the, the key about, about design is engaging people around you to do design work. And design work is, is really first and foremost about listening, which we've talked about a fair bit. It's also about uh, really synthesizing down to the key problem, define the problem, don't let the problem define you. And uh, the final thing is uh, to consider uh, how you're gonna test ideas. Very often people uh, get to that convergent idea where they say, this is, the, this is the idea. And they're holding on to the idea so tightly. If I grab a piece of paper uh, from my printer, and this, consider this is an idea. Now, if I hold this idea lightly and you pull the idea away, then the idea is still intact. So if I don't fall in love with the idea, it means I, you can take the idea off me and change it and make it better. But if I hold that idea really tightly and you try to pull it off, it's going to end up ripping. It's going to end up destroying the idea. You see children doing this with their uh, ideas when they've invested so much in an early idea, they can't take feedback anymore and they end up throwing a tantrum and ripping up their idea. Well, adults do it too, but um, often without realizing that they've done it. So consider how you can harness your middle leadership in that design effort. Now, I'll share the last segment and then um, we're going to open up for some questions as well. Um, and for this last segment, um, it's again, it's, it's all related. Um, you've got to uh, design success You've got to uh, design, the, design the brief, design what success is going to look like. And then the final thing is you've got to communicate it. Um, and communicating decisions is a key part of decision making that is not undertaken very well in a lot of um, education institutions. A lot of people sometimes feel that they didn't know what was going on. So I'm not using the word communicate, I'm using the word radiate. Radiate is much more positive than communicate. Communication must remain really positive. Why? Because not everyone sees what's going on here as an opportunity. And um, there have been a lot of talks over the past month or so where people um, use the, the Chinese uh, phrase for crisis and they, they, they mistakenly say that the Chinese word for crisis uh, means uh, uh, opportunity, that it has a, an opportunity in it. It means both danger and opportunity. It doesn't. Uh, the Chinese word is closer to the Greek version. Uh, it means that there is a disaster at the point of a juncture. And it could go either way. We could uh, come out of this uh, happy and fortunate, or we could come out of this uh, in a very negative way. So communication is a key part of making sure that you have a better chance of coming out of this in a positive way. And so that's why I'm saying radiate. And the phrase comes from the chap in this picture. Um, the chap shaking his head at my daughter is uh, Keith Cook. He's an amazing coach, amazing fencing coach. And um, when he fences the, uh, with these young people and when he teaches them, coaches them how to uh, perform, something he always reminds them about attitude is that even when you're losing, it's really important to keep that positive attitude. 
Um, he says, you know, in life, uh, you have a combination of uh, people. You have people who are radiators and on cold, miserable days, you want to stand next to those radiators. And there are people in life who are drains. And when they're drains, you don't want to stand under a drain. You're going to get very wet or get it sucked away. So when you're choosing uh, who you choose to, to stand with, uh, when not everyone signed up for this, you have the choice to be a radiator to be the person that people choose to come towards because they know that you're going to help, you're going to be positive and you're going to find, uh, find out uh, what happens next. Now, this is not about making uh, false promises to people. And I think there's a really important uh, communication point here. It's really important to give people hope, uh, but it's really important not to give people false hope. Um, there is not going to be a new normal. You cannot guarantee the long-term vision of what's going to happen in the world. And you can't promise people that things are going to go back. And you can't promise people either that things are going to fundamentally change. And I've seen governments and school leaders make the mistake of proclaiming both. Uh, and journalists, of course, say what they want. They paint both pictures. But neither of these is going to happen. Actually, what happens is different. There's going to be a different uh, way of doing things. And there's always been a different way of doing things. People like me spend their lives talking about how things might be different and helping people reimagine what that different might be. So giving people that hope is super important, but don't give them false hope. So how do you avoid giving them false hope? Well, you design, you listen to them. So you understand the starting point, where are they coming from? Um, what's their starting point? So that at that point, you know, if you're pitching an idea here, but their starting point is there, there's a bit of work to do between the two. But if their starting point is somewhere down underneath the desk here, and you're promising a vision that's way up there, you're making a false hope, false promise, because you'll never get there together. So design is super important. Clear communication, which is not just about you broadcasting, but about you listening to and so there are some things that you can do to engage your team in that way. And I'll give you one tool before we pause uh, for some, uh, some questions. And please put your questions into the chat. There's a chat uh, that you've, you've left your name and where you, where you come from. So you can leave questions in that chat there. Um, but what you can also do is um, uh, if you leave a question there, we might call on you just to switch your microphone on and you can share it with me uh, live um, on the video. So um, for this final, a kind of tool or strategy that can help you. Um, it's really about how to engage your own team in this. I think that one of the headaches, one of the challenges that um, a few leaders have had is that it's all good and well to say, uh, be a radiator, be positive. But the reality is in your team, you're always going to have people who are more committed than others. So how do you deal with commitment and skill in dealing with the challenges and the design work that's ahead? If you think of it like a two by two matrix, you've got a matrix where you've high commitment down to low commitment or variable commitment, and then you've got high competence, high skill and less skill. And this is not critical of people, of teaching staff. It's the fact that everyone is good at some stuff and less good at other things. And everyone has high commitment to some parts of the cause that we're all part of. And some of us have less commitment to that. So the green zone is where people have high commitment and high competence. They are your rock stars. And they are, whether, you, whether they have the job title or not, give them support so that they can take up position as coaches, as mentors, as reverse mentor to you if you're a senior leader. And you can delegate projects to them and trust them to get on. They are highly committed. They are highly skilled. Do not micromanage them. Give them a job, let them get on with it and see what magic they can create. And you'll also have people with high commitment to the cause, but maybe variable skill. Uh, they're not, maybe it's new. For example, teachers who are fantastic in a face-to-face -face environment, but maybe feel less confident in an online environment or blended environment. Well, they're highly committed, so they're trainable. They, they'll give, they'll put in the effort, they'll give the time to learn how. And so train them up, uh, match them up with your green mentors and together, uh, they'll be able to do it. Those people often need told, uh, here's what I want you to do and here's how to do it. Then you have people with low commitment and some skill. Now, the low commitment is the challenge here. There's something blocking their commitment to the cause. It could be stress um, or it could be something else. You've got to unblock that, whatever that is, because once you do, 
they become highly committed people and they're trainable. So you can persuade by listening to them, uh, be open to their ideas and maybe see uh, where the challenges for them are and help them overcome those hurdles. Job number one of any leadership team is remove the hurdles for people so they can get on with their job. So that's a conversation. Now the bottom right corner is probably the most problematic, variable commitment and high skill. High skilled people, but with variable commitment or no commitment. They're what we call genius jerks and they're super unpredictable. The way that we've always found you works best is, is listen to them, find out where they're at, give them the vision that you have as a team that you've created as a community, but then let them go off and decide how to go about it. Don't micromanage them. They won't respond well. It'll in fact, lower their commitment. Um, but their skills mean that they've probably got the capacity to work out um, how to go about it. And so that two by two is hopefully useful for you as a way to think not about what you're going to do alone, but also to think about who is going to do that work. So those three points that I mentioned today, uh, listening is just such a core part of the design process. And when there's no plan, listening is a daily activity. So where is your daily opportunity to listen to your community? Uh, it might mean phoning up a couple of people, a couple of parents and having a conversation with them to find out how things are going. And because there's no deadline, you really need to design with intent. You need to test the assumptions that people have and you need to be very aware of your starting point, of your reality. Take your time to design and then the work is easier. If you rush into the work without designing it, uh, then you will end up spending a lot of effort for an uncertain return. And then because not everyone signed up for this, radiate in your communication. Now, if I go back to our transition design process that we've been using with schools, listening is a whole chapter on itself about how to listen. Um, uh, how do you find out the strengths of your community during tough times? The design section is about you designing your brief. Don't let the crisis define your goal. F find out what your own midterm objectives are for yourself. Don't let others define them for you. Design success. So what are the key results that you want to realize and, and when do you think you're going to be able to do that? And then design the pre-mortem. So for every idea, every plan you have, it's going to go awry, it's going to go wrong. So do a pre-mortem. A pre-mortem is more useful than a post-mortem. Uh, post-mortem is when the patient is already dead, when the plan is already dead. A pre-mortem uh, helps you work out how your plan will die. Um, and then you can mitigate, you can change and come up with contingencies. And then the final part in communication, that radiating uh, warmth that you're going to give. Uh, the first thing is get ready, um, then aim and then fire. So think about what it is you're trying to communicate. Think about who you're trying to communicate with at that given point and then do it. Do the communication. Planning communication is useless unless you actually communicate. And the final thing is uh, practice. Don't give up at the first go. Um, practice with peers. Come to sessions like this and share your ideas with peers. Don't be shy about doing that. Um, practice with your team and above all, enjoy uh, practicing with your staff, uh, with your with your students, uh, rehearse the story that you want to create together before you throw all your eggs into one basket. And so that's an overview of how uh, thinking about transition design can help you build on the silver linings um, that are there if you're willing to look for them and create a different kind of school, a different kind of schooling and keep the learning uh, going. Uh, way beyond this crisis and uh, far into the future. So listen, thank you so much for sticking with me for uh, 40 minutes of Scottish accent. Um, I'm aware that we've had, we've had some people dropping in uh, through the session as well. You can catch up um, with what's been broadcast on YouTube. There's a, we're broadcasting live to YouTube at the moment and there'll be an archived video there for you too. Um, but at the moment, if anyone has a question, then you can fire that into the chat. And otherwise I'm going to pass back to Jyoti, who I think between, uh, Jyoti and Anu already have a question or two that they might want to ask on your behalf. Thank you, Ben, for a wonderful session. I'll just scroll through the chat box. If we have questions, we can take them up. 
So there's a question from uh, Ramanjit Guman. Do we relook at the school vision for virtual school? I have seen some schools. So the, what was the question, sorry? Do we relook at the school vision for virtual school? I have seen ah. some schools. Yeah, it's, um, so thank you Ramanjit for your question. I think that, that this is a, a I'm going to rephrase the question because I think that what you might be asking is, do we change the school vision uh, yeah. just because we've moved everything online? So do we abandon everything we had um, and then go back? Well, the, the first thing I would uh, say is... Um, just to come yeah. in, just to come in. So what yeah, I so wanted go to ask... Yes. Nice yes. to meet you as well. Hi. Yes, <laughs> good to see you. Yeah, uh, what I wanted to come in was that the uh, what I saw some schools doing, so I was confused. So the vision stays... School vision is whatever it is. Yeah. And then uh, they're creating a vision for the virtual school separately as a subset. So is that like advisable? Because I'm confused. So that's why. Well, I'm confused too. I think that's a great question. I'm confused because the, the thing that a vision is to tell you, you've got two things in a school. One is your vision. And the other, of course, is your purpose, your mission. Mm -hmm. So first thing is that a lot of schools don't, a lot of school leaders, a lot of business leaders too, don't really know the difference between the two. They conflate them. They, they, they think they're the same. So um, let's get that sorted, first of all. Uh, your purpose, for me, is your first thing. It's your go-to. So purpose, for me, is uh, uh, when you are able to express uh, what your school uh, is there for. And your purpose should begin with because. So your, your purpose should be pretty quick and simple to give. Now, I'm a typical boy. I can't do two things at once. Uh, I'm going to show you a, a vision, though, and in fact, a mission, sorry, a purpose statement, and I can do it by going to the school's website. And of course, this is the, 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 the great thing about a good mission is you should be able to find it easily. So let's see if that's true. I'm going to uh, the International School of Luxembourg, and two years ago, when life was simple. Uh, we helped them to rethink their purpose, but we also helped them create a vision for the future. So we had these two jobs to do. And um, the purpose of the, the school, uh, let me just find it in, the, in their website. There we go. And I can, I can share my screen so you can, uh, you can actually see this for yourselves. Um, the purpose of the school is expressed with a little bit of a because. Why, why do you exist, International School of Luxembourg? Because we ensure that everyone in our community becomes inspired, resilient, and passionate about achieving what matters anywhere in the world. That's it. It's a because. And a lot of school purposes are not becauses. So if I had an, an option, I would first of all look at your purpose. And I would ask yourself, it, does our purpose work in a crisis? If it doesn't stand up today, then your mission never stood up in the first place. And it's what I call um, plastic purpose. And I call it plastic purpose because most of these missions are on plastic plaques somewhere on a wall <laughs> or behind the director's chair uh, on the shelf. I'm looking at your shelves trying to work out if you've got one there. <laughs> if they are plastic purposes, then yeah. um, unscrew it from the wall, throw it away, okay. um, one more piece of plastic in the ocean and uh, come up with something different and the way you come I up with do. something different is just what I described listen yeah. to people find out what makes your school tick and actually if you've got a good purpose that's um, good enough yes. for the moment yes. yes over time I would absolutely think about the future but mm. I would not create a separate vision for a digital school for a virtual school Great. because your school you know 10 that's, years ago when I, when, I, yeah. when I worked at channel 4 television uh, they still separated digital from television. Now today, that's a bizarre thought because mm. television is digital. Everything is, everyone watches television with a second screen right there in their hand. At the time they didn't, 11 years ago, 12 years ago. So remove the word digital and just say, what's the experience of learning my children have had at home? Yeah. And if you, if you have children of your own, ask, what was that experience yeah. like at school? Absolutely. Mine my youngest one finished yesterday and my oldest one finishes today for summer. And the older one was saying, this is it's brilliant. I can choose what I do, yeah. when I do it, how long I spend doing it. And they've been able to get good at stuff that frankly, 
during school they never had enough time to dive into yeah. so how do we uh, make sure that every child has the time and space to do really well at the thing they want to do really well at and um, you know that's the question I would ask and the answer you get from your parents and your staff and above all your students that's your vision so no, don't come up with a second vision for your virtual Thank school. You. Just Thank ask you. your kids. Thank you. say, I was confused. No, I didn't <laughs> want to do it, but I was so confused. I said, oh my God, what's happening around me? Thank you for yeah. clarity. Thank you. No worries. And apologies if uh, I've probably created all sorts of arguments now in a lot of schools, but there you go. That's that's part and parcel. And we've got some so other questions, was, Jyoti, as well. Yes, so that was Ramanjeet, ma'am, from Oak Ridge International Mohali. Thank you, ma'am, for the insight, insightful question. The next question comes from Namrita, who says students are missing out on significant milestones such as exams and farewells. These yeah. are the rites of passages. How can we help make this transition less painful for them? Well, thank you, Namrita. And, and Namrita, if you've got your microphone, feel free to turn it on. Um, it's really, it was really nice being able to see and hear Ramanjit there. So um, same for you. And uh, I can see you've got your audio on. Um, Hello. There we are. Hi, how are you doing? So. Is this a particular pain that you're feeling yourself at school? Um, yeah, so in KC High, we have a first batch of students graduating from grade 12, and we are not able to be with them. We couldn't spend the last few months with them. And yeah. I'm sure it's much harder for them. If for me as a teacher, I'm experiencing all these feelings. And I was reading up a little on like different researchers and how the class 2020 class of Corona is going to feel. So I wanted to understand what else can we do? Well. I think that, that that challenge is even shared by colleagues in primary school too. I had um, a, a wonderful primary school educator um, here in Edinburgh and she was saying how, you know, primary three, uh, they have a valedictory set service, if you like, before they go off into the big junior school. Um, but it's an excuse for a party, for a celebration. And she reads a story to them because they're young. Uh, so mm -hmm. she reads their favorite story of the year. So she had to do this in video and she told me that she had already um, read this three times and kept bursting into tears. And it was mm -hmm. she was so sad not to be able to give them this transition. So it's mm -hmm. not just grade 12s leaving school to go off to whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's also um, any transition point from early years to primary, primary to secondary or middle school to high school. So how do we help young people with those transitions is maybe the question. Um, some students I know were quite happy not to have exams this year. Some students were fed up because that's all they care about. Yeah. I would go back to Namrita's previous question and uh, sorry, uh, Ramanjit's previous question um, and say, does our vision as a school, is our purpose as a school to push children through examinations or is it something else? And I know that culturally examinations are really important to a lot of families and a lot of children. Um, maybe this is the opportunity to begin shifting that culture a little bit mm -hmm. uh, beginning to realize that school is about more than passing exams mm -hmm. and then you've got honestly you've got to ask the question does our school do more than pass exams because if the answer is no then that's something I would be working on for the next year to make sure that mm -hmm. you can hand on heart say yeah we're about more than exams because when you're about more than exams that doesn't matter so much End of year parties, end of year celebrations, you can do so much. Uh, mm. So you can have a school disco on Zoom, uh, which is uh, one of the DJs here in Edinburgh morning radio. Uh, he, he's the radio station that everyone listens to in the morning. So today or Friday, I think uh, maybe he's hold, holding the school disco for all the children in the city. So phone up your local radio station and ask your the favorite DJ of your of your students. Can you do an end of school disco for us? And, um, you know, they might be apart, but at least they can have a laugh together online and, you know, and create a beautiful story as well. I think creating stories is what young people want for the end of school. And you know what? Get them back. Yes, they might go to different countries, universities, different cities, but get them back next year or the year after mm -hmm. and um, reflect on, on how resilient they have been mm -hmm. um, and how special they will be as young people for actually making it through this tricky period and getting into something. Uh, and that's about radiating again, not just communicating, but being that kind of positive force for people. Um, mm -hmm. It counts for so much. So um, think about online events. I think 
that you know yesterday with younger kids it was really nice for them to come in smaller groups so um, the teacher brought together all the girls in the class and then all the boys in the class so it was a smaller group and they could actually talk to each other on a zoom call yeah. and then she brought them all together and they played a quiz together and a treasure hunt around the house um, and as parents we had to hide a snack for the children in a place in the house and we were the last clue so they had a teddy bears picnic at the end of that class session so you can be creative you can have fun and I think if you're having fun if you're enjoying it then your students will mm -hmm. too if you're celebrating them then your students will have no problem celebrating too I hope that's useful I hope it's helpful yes thank you so much and I understand the exam was just an example and it's more to do with connecting and bouncing off one another and learning and, you know, going through the process together. But you've yeah. given a lot of ideas for me to think about. So thank you so and, much. Yeah, and, and learning never stops. You know, that's yeah. it. Just because it's the end of the year doesn't mean their learning stopped. They're going to continue right. learning, you know, depending on what they've lined up. If they've not lined up anything, then there's an opportunity to rethink school. You know, maybe next year you need extra people in school. So can you use some of those students who are not going to university who don't know what they're going to do next, could you bring them back as student uh, interns or mentors for the year 11s and 12s, you know, and give an opportunity for that year to come back together and be part of your community still for the first six months might be quite tricky as we head back and we need more, more bodies to look after the kids. So is there a way mm -hmm. to integrate young people in that way? Lots of creative ways we can go about that. Thank you. And Joe, did you want to field a couple more questions? I can see some yeah, hitting the chat. Uh, yes. So we have one question from Sonia Mawani, who is from Shivnada School. Uh, she says, how do we satisfy expectations from parents who seek more synchronous time, even for primary years? Yeah, um, it's a great question, Sonia. And probably three three bits to the answer to that again if you have your microphone and video feel free to turn it on um it's really nice to see uh really nice to see and hear people and uh, and and see the whether the answer is actually meeting their expectations or not so i think the first thing is the synchronous time we'll deal with that synchronous time doing what uh, there is a question about what parents think their their child is doing in school when you're when they're not there so do they think that the children sit in school all day listening to a teacher? Um, and if they think that, and it's not true, then you've got to do a better job maybe at painting a picture of what your school actually does do in the year. If, you're, if your young people are used to doing interdisciplinary projects and rich projects, then that should be less of an issue. So for example, um, in my daughter's own school, it's not an issue. Uh, we know that they do rich projects. We know that they are trying to become ever more independent learners. So um, I don't expect to have lots of teacher time. So my daughter has uh, two short meetings a week, more to say hello to her teacher and talk through any challenges they've got. Otherwise she's learning everything much more independently. Um, and I would say that in primary school, those skills of um, self-discipline, of um, uh, learning about learning, being able to cope with learning, all of those skills are developed in primary school, not secondary. So it's even more important in primary school that young people learn how to cope with learning for themselves. Um, so you might consider uh, some information, some communication around that. Here's how we want your child to, to continue learning for themselves. And if you're worried that the children can't cope with that kind of independent learning, then maybe program um, so, some time <clears throat> where you can teach them strategies explicitly um, on how to think for themselves um, and integrate it with the work they're doing. So if there's a project they're undertaking, make sure they've got a framework to do their thinking and then give them the framework to print out at home or to draw. And I tend to go for frameworks that you can you know, draw yourself on a piece of paper, nothing too complicated. And it means that even the child who doesn't have an internet connection at home or who's borrowing mum or dad's laptop um, for 10 minutes a day, they're able to, to, to work independently without the need for lots and lots of technology. Um, synchronous learning for seven hours a day online is a really bad idea. And, uh, you know, I've, I've spent an hour with you guys online. It's pretty exhausting. Um, I don't intend to spend much longer today in front of a screen. Um, I've got lots of work to do that doesn't involve a screen. So I think it's super important to make sure that, that people understand 
there is life beyond the teacher talking at kids and tell them what that is. It involves independent reading, it involves personal projects, it involves uh, challenges, uh, treasure hunts, it involves uh, uh, observation of the world out around you, it involves cooking, and uh, we've done lots of that together. So make sure that parents are really clear on the curriculum that you're expecting people to have. And that goes back to, to Ramanjit's question around vision, make sure the vision's clear. If your vision's not clear, then people will fill the gap with whatever they think learning is. And that's not a particularly useful position to be in. So be clear. I think we've got we've got time for one quick question, maybe, if you want to, yes. um, so or we can draw to a close. Yeah, that is from Aditi Budhiraja. She's a, a school librarian in Ramathis School. And she says that as a librarian, how can she engage more with the learners considering they are at immense loss of getting any library resources issued? Oh, what a, what a brilliant and horrible question to end on because it's so complex in a way. Uh, it, it, I'm not a librarian and I defer to the expertise of, of the librarians in, in this case, but um, I would suggest that um, the role of librarian is very clear in terms of co-designing and co-working with teachers to create the kind of independent learning experiences we're talking about. I've seen some children operating on intellectual fumes. You know, they don't have enough input to be able to synthesize and have a creative output. So they need uh, pointed in the direction of not just online resources, but resources in the community, experiences that they can be part of. So um, do think about um, how you can co-design projects and packages of learning with teachers. That's a really practical way to do it. And then maybe organize a session every week um, where you just, you know, with younger children, a reading session. So children are not getting read to at home every day. Don't be under any illusions that even if you work in a, an elite school that uh, children get read to. So just having once a week or once a day, uh, but once a week probably, where kids can have a story read to them and then talk about their favorite parts. That, that could be something that a librarian does. And you could do one for grade 12, where you highlight an amazing new book that's come out that would be of interest to them and uh, give them an, an insight there. So hopefully that's uh, two helpful suggestions for, for, for how you might do that. You can probably hear in a lot of the answers uh, that I'm giving that the three principles still stand. Listen a lot to your community and don't think that the listening stops just because you, you've you come to a conclusion about what people are, are saying you need. Um, design, have a process for design. And if you don't know how, ask for help. There are people like our organization there. We have lots of help on our website, but um, you can also engage. We're gonna launch a whole bunch of online sessions as well uh, that people can engage with at, at super low cost. So there's potential there to get some more input there. Um, and then the final part, communicate in a really positive way uh, and on a regular way. So that radiate, you know, radiate the, the vision and the purpose that you have as a school and, and uh, uh, share the good stories of what people are doing so that others have a model of what a good experience can feel like and how it can be, even if they themselves are having a, having a tough day at that particular point. Uh, our time has come to an end, which is unbelievable. Thank you to everyone who joined. We had um, uh, lots of people joining us here on Zoom. We had more still on YouTube uh, joining us there. And this clip, of course, is available for eternity in the internet, in, on the internet, uh, thanks to uh, that YouTube live stream. So thanks again for the invitation. And uh, no doubt we will see each other all again very soon.